The future's so bright, I've got to wear shades. But we're going to talk about Houston. No, not Whitney Houston. 45 drives! Forty-five drives. They make the Storinator. <laughs> they recently gave level one the Storinator because, uh, ooh, we're getting low on disk space. Look, I, it can only last so long. <laughs> the storage server made out of garbage, and it's basically full. And we still got to get more hard drives on top of this. So there's going to be yet another video just as soon as we got some more drives to talk about because, well, that's pretty exciting. While we wait, I, uh, I couldn't help myself. I've modified the 45 drive software. Now a 45 drives chassis, you can run whatever you want. You could run Windows, you could run FreeBSD, you could run whatever you want. But 45 drives has been working on a software distribution that has some features that ticks the boxes. And they call their control software Houston. Uh, it's sort of based on Cockpit, which is a Red Hat technology really, or at least Red Hat spending the most money developing it, I think. Does that mean Oracle spending the most money? No, no. Oh, that's that's crazy. So it's got some pretty cool features and we can go sort of step by step through the features Which is really pretty awesome. If you didn't see our, our other video That walks you through the unboxing and some of the hardware you get you should definitely check that out because it's a chassis that holds 30 drives uh, We added a, another external disk shelf to it one of the old NetApp disk shelves for a total of 54 drives That's why we call it Studio 54 standard IO 54 it's a it's a programmer joke. I promise it's funny. So we've made some modifications that are pretty good quality of life improvements. There's a how-to on the guide and I wanted to walk you through what we did, some of the big things. The biggest and best quality of life improvement is by far hooking up the previous versions tab in Windows clients to ZFS snapshots. This is awesome. Everybody should have this. Basically, when you right click on a share and go to properties, there's a previous versions tab. And this gives you GUI access to the snapshots from ZFS in Windows. The underlying technology here, Samba and VFS objects, do support other things other than ZFS. But it works basically out of the box with ZFS. There's a script that you need to get and some steps that you need to run. But it is a pretty trivial setup to get this going. And you can also configure your snapshot policy. You could do two snapshots a day and keep two weeks of snapshots. That's the old Windows Server 2003 default. But you could also do five or six snapshots a day, 10 snapshots a day. You could create a policy where you've got a lot of snapshots for the last couple of days and then fewer and fewer snapshots going back as far as six months. Basically anything you can think of as long as you've got the disk space to do it. It's a really pretty awesome quality of life improvement and it makes it easy to recover if somebody accidentally deletes something. It's self-service. You can just go to the share, you browse the, the old one, you find the file that you want, and then you can copy it out of the old snapshot and into the new one if it's something you've moved or deleted. <laughs> well, you moved it and you don't know where you moved it to or it's otherwise been deleted and you couldn't bother to you know, use a search to find out where you accidentally drug the folder or moved it or whatever. The second almost as big quality of life improvement is the ability to run containers. Now, they've done a really good job of 45 drives to put a little polish on this to give you a virtual machines interface. And I don't want to take anything away from that. There's a virtual machines tab here. You can create a virtual machine. You can change the storage. Storage can be on ZFS. It can be on the RAID 1 pool where your, your hard drives are. Got a lot of options. For us, I want to do everything with containers. Well, the tricky part here is do we use Docker or do we use something else? Well, Mm, Podman is uh, what I'm going to recommend. I sort of started to do this how-to guide with Docker, but for some reasons I don't want to get into, I don't think Docker is the best choice for this setup. And to be sure, Podman is also really not the best setup for this either because Podman full support is really uh, on Ubuntu 20.10, and this is based on 20.04 LTS. Urgh. But... Fortunately, some smart people have backported, essentially, the Podman functionality, and it works. Now, if you're not in the loop, Podman is basically a drop-in replacement for Docker. It's a little bit more uh, free and open source supporting kind of thing. Again, I don't want to get into it super a lot, but basically, if you're looking at a how-to and it's like Docker RM, blah, 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 or Docker PS, blah, 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 you can just substitute 
Podman. You can even alias Podman to be Docker. In fact, I think they recommend that in some of their documentation. And then you'll be up and running with Podman. Well, the Cockpit also has a pretty reasonable GUI plugin for Podman that I think is better than the one for Docker unless you're on Ubuntu 18.04 LTS, in which case then the, the, the Docker thing is better for Cockpit than 20.04, but if you're on 20.04 or 20.10, Podman, better GUI. So you can run a, a Docker container called LanCache and LanCache DNS. And there's, a, again, a how-to guide on the forum. But basically, you make a couple changes on your network's DNS server, or you use LanCache DNS as your actual DNS server on your network. And then uh, traffic requests for Steam and EA and Blizzard and a few other things will actually go through your 45 drive storinator um, to download game files. So when you queue up a download on Steam, if it has been downloaded before, you'll actually just pull it from your 45 drives machine, which chances are has fast disks and a fast network access. So in our case, where pretty much everything in the office is 10 or 25 gig, we can pull games at you know about a gigabyte per second. The, the limiting factor is actually CPU overhead from Steam itself. You need a pretty beefy CPU to be able to pull down at a gigabyte per second because Steam's protocols were, were not designed for a CPU that was that powerful that you would need to be able to pull down at a gigabyte per second. But if you do have a really powerful CPU, you can download games at a gigabyte per second plus. You got two and a half gig, you know, networking or or something like that, you're still gonna benefit from that for the local cache as long as your network attached storage has that. Also, Pi Hole. So that's another DNS technology where you can filter out ads at the network level. So you can turn your Storinator into something that will filter out all of the ads and bad stuff, basically anything that's caught up with Pi Hole. And installation is pretty easy. You don't have to go as full fat as something like a full-fledged virtual machine. You can just do all that with a container. Now, one really weird thing that I noticed with the GUI here, and this is not a 45 drives thing, this is a Podman GUI thing, is the GUI here for doing port mapping doesn't let you map an IP address to a port. So with containers, where things like DNS, you know, sometimes your DHCP client will actually use the DNS port, port 53, uh, DNS cache and things like that sometimes are part of the protocol. That's another conversation, but um, it's, it's not super unusual to have a machine like this use multiple IP addresses on your LAN. And so it would be really awesome if you could just say, I'm gonna have the Storinator use three or four IP addresses this is the one that we're going to use for file sharing. This is the one that we're going to use for LAN cache. This is the one that we're going to, or LAN cache and LAN cache, cache DNS. This is the one that we're going to use for Pi Hole. Uh, but there's not really a way to bind a uh, network address to a particular container. You can tell that whoever built this GUI probably hasn't done a lot with containers because when you get into like whole fleets of containers, having that flexibility to bind a bunch of containers to a bunch of IP addresses on, on one thing is basically what you're doing every single day and i'm very surprised that the feature is not there the gui is actually broken if you try to feed at an ip address and a port number through the gui unless i'm just doing something horribly wrong but that's probably something that needs to be addressed probably something that will be addressed in the not too distant future now that i've pointed it out other things you can do that will really help the performance of the machine is reconfigure samba for multi-channel support uh, i'm gonna there's a link to a presentation on the level one forum that's about multi-channel from a few years ago. And they're like, ah, we implemented multi-channel. We think it's okay. It might lead to data corruption. And from that one sort of offhanded, nah, it might lead to data corruption issue. A lot of people still don't run it by default. I've had it on for years here, but there hasn't been any data corruption that I've noticed moving media files from, uh, you know, SD cards and CFast cards and things like that, basically at wire speed to the, network storage server, even multiple files at a time. Definitely when multi-channel is in use because you know some of the machines are, are dual 10 gig, some of the machines are just a single 25 gig, some of the machines are like dual one gig. And so 200 megabytes per second, 300 megabytes per second, that's roughly the neighborhood of the copy speed at peak 
And if there's going to be multi-channel corruption, you would think there's going to be multi-channel corruption in that kind of a scenario. Knock on wood with our old storage server and now with the new 45 drive storage server, multi-channel works really well. Well, multi-channel works best if you've got a multi-port 10 gig adapter, but it can help even if you don't have a, a, a multi-port 10 gig adapter. In the scenario where the storinator is running with a 10 gig interface, but you've got a client that has say two one gig connections, you'll still benefit from multi-channel. It'll transfer at about 200 megabytes per second, 100 meg on each gigabit connection. So it's definitely worth enabling multi-channel support in SMB on a storinator, even if you've only got a single 10 gig connection. If you're using multiple one gig connections on your Storinator, it's definitely, definitely worth enabling there. Although you'd really benefit from upgrading to something faster than, you know, multiple one gigs. Let's see what else we got in this how-to. That's pretty much it for the big ticket items for uh, modifications that I would recommend to the 45 drives platform. Those are, those are really pretty big stuff. If you're a tweaker like us, you could also install LM sensors and get more sensor data. There's a lot of good sensor data on the 45 drives cockpit dashboard as it is, but you can add even more, especially if you've got more adapters that you've added in. Also, you can add PCI Express M.2 adapters. If you get into that, setting up the PCIe bifurcation to turn those X8 slots on the motherboard into X4, X4 can get a little tricky. Check out our other video or the guide because we walk you through how to do that. It, it's a little weird because the the uh, Cascade Lake Xeon processors have three or no two 24 lane PCIe root complexes, and so it's all it's 888 coming out of the CPU, and when you configure it, it's like X4 X4 X8 it's X8 or X8 X4 X4 X8, and it's, it's a little sketchy. Uh, there's a lot of other stuff on there, like you could install Portainer. If Portainer is more your style for container management. Uh, you should check that out because it gives you a really super nice GUI for container management that has no BS and no problems at all. And maybe using the uh, Podman GUI to install Portainer to then give you an even more advanced GUI for managing containers. That <sighs> just seems so hacky and weird, but Portainer is a very, very good container management software and you can use that to manage land cache and pie hole and, and that kind of stuff. So that might be something uh, worth considering. There's a little bit more info about that in the guide on the forum. Uh, if you have any questions or I missed something or there's some other quality of life improvements, you can definitely do it. And this is all running with uh, Linux as a base OS. So, I mean, it is a long-term support version of Ubuntu, but you've got later drivers uh, for more advanced hardware. It's a little easier to get working really, really high end hardware, especially when you start, sort of start going off script with like the, the 25 and 50 gigabit stuff. Um, it can be a little difficult to, to get that set up. And there seems to be a lot more guides and how to's, um, for Linux than some of the alternatives. Uh, if you want to go totally off script, I mean, you could use windows and storage spaces, but I don't recommend it. I definitely like what I see so far with what 45 drives is doing with Houston, but I'm not really going to get to take it for a full spin until I load in another, you know, 15 or 30 drives or something like that. As it is now, our ZFS pool is made up of a bunch of VDEVs and I've also got a bunch of uh, M.2 added in for our uh, metadata special devices so that file lookups and directory listings and stuff like that are blazing fast because it comes from a striped mirror of NVMe, which is really like super overkill. You don't need a striped mirror of NVMe most of the time. I just, I just like it. So yeah, a lot of fun stuff. <laughs> a lot, a lot of upgrades. We've, we've maxed out our chassis. Check out the other video on that. So this has been a lot of fun. Again, big thanks to 45 drives for providing this. And, uh, uh, these are my thoughts so far on the software platform. So, uh, you know, if you have a DIY system, you could deploy this with cockpit and my modifications. No problem on whatever you have. You can, you can DIY this on your own hardware all day long. This has been a quick look at Houston command center on, uh, our 45 drives chassis. And, uh, you know, again, big thanks to 45 drives for sending us a chassis to play with. And, uh, it's been a lot of fun upgrading it and really, really going off script, doing all of the stuff that, that they definitely don't want to have to support end users in doing because the chances are when there's a problem, it's because they changed something, but they'll do their best. If you have any questions or anything like that, I'll be hanging out in the level one forums. I'm signing out and I'll see you there.